Welcome to this Jeremy Bamba and White House Farm podcast. In this episode, Philip and Yvonne caught up with polygraph expert Terry Mullins. Terry qualified as a professional polygraph examiner at Maryland Institute of Criminal Justice, which is an American Polygraph Association accredited training school. He's a member of the American Polygraph Association and the current secretary of the British Polygraph Association. He's also the key driver in the introduction into the UK of the new polygraph test called iDetect. Terry has conducted polygraph testing on many UK prisoners in his long career, two of which, Ray Gilbert and Luke Mitchell, are mentioned in Terry's discussion with us. Terry also mentions Jeremy's legal representative in 2007. This was Giovanni De Stefano, and it was unknown to Jeremy at that time that De Stefano was not qualified to practice. After 10 years of applications and requests to the Home Office to be able to take the polygraph test, approval was finally granted for Jeremy to have the test in 2007. It was conducted in Full Sutton Prison in April that year by Mr Mullins. Jeremy passed the test conclusively and Terry Mullins recorded no deception indicated. Here's what Terry told us during our fascinating meeting regarding the results of his tests on Jeremy and how this science is continually developing. Uh, my name is Terry Mullins. Um, I'm a polygraph examiner and I also um, run another business called Integrity Assured using a new polygraph called iDetect. Um, and that's something that I would be using uh, with Jeremy uh, if, if and when I get the chance. Um, I've been a polygraph examiner since March 2005. Um, so I wasn't that long in the job when I first met Jeremy. Um, I was contacted by a newspaper, um, and you'll have to forgive me, but I think it was the Daily Mail. And they asked me if I would conduct a polygraph test on Jeremy at Fort Sutton Prison. Yeah. Um, I had been to uh, a couple of prisons prior to that but not with such a high profile um, person. Um, I was actually aware of Jeremy's uh, case going back into 1985, because as I live in Essex, it was quite high profile at that time. I don't have an opinion um, of whether he did anything or not. Um, but it was arranged very quickly. The prison at Fort Sutton were very um, compliant and helpful in arranging the test for me. That's and good. they gave me full access to him within a legal room um, with privacy. Um, I was quite surprised uh, when Jeremy walked in. He didn't look like he did from his original photographs from some 20 years earlier. Um, but he was an extremely pleasant man. And we had a small conversation um, because I wanted him to feel comfortable with me, yeah. uh, which is very important in uh, something that we were doing. Um, so I'd already researched Jeremy very well. Um, I researched and picked out the most salient points, which was really around about the shooting with the Anschult rifle. Um, so that's, that was the most important part of this. It's not about how he felt, whether he intended doing something, whether he thought about doing it. It's the actual factual side of actually um, shooting or allegedly shooting his family. Yeah. Um, so Jeremy gave me um, a very potted history of problems and issues that, he, that they'd have been going through, especially with Sheila, and um, identified the fact that he was not in the, in the uh, premises at the time and that he had been outside with the police prior to, um, prior to this uh, happening. Um, Prior to this happening, he was outside with a police officer when there were um, signs of movement and noises with, from within the property, which, if nothing else, would have excluded him from um, shooting Sheila Caffell, because Absolutely. as I'm aware, just by all the information. Um, but other than that, we then set out and I went through a list of questions for Jeremy, um, and I can read those out to you, the ones that I... Used. Fantastic. Sorry? 
Fantastic. Yeah. So I, I've actually just pulled up his his uh, his report. I still have that. I think you've got a copy of it. Yeah, we've got a copy. Yeah. Um, but I thought that the most salient questions to ask him, which would identify everything, is um, did you shoot your family on the 7th of August, 1985? To which Jeremy answered no. Um, I don't really look for signs of emotion or anything else on a person's face. Jeremy was sitting sideways onto me, and he should have had his back to me. But because of the situation in the prison, um, I could only get him to sit sideways. Um, but I, I don't look for signs because I let the test do its job. The second question, did you shoot five members of your family on the 7th of August, 1985, with an Schultz rifle, to which Jeremy answered no again? And the final question, were you present inside the house when five members of your family were shot with an Anschultz rifle? And he also answered no. Now, on a, a mute point, which was brought up by the American Polygraph Association on, on question three, was that um, was he present inside the house when five members of the family were shot? Uh, brought in a question of, if he was outside of the house at the time um, when Sheila was allegedly shot or shot herself, um, would that question still stand? So I explained that I used the information from the conviction um, that he had at that time, which was the preposition that he actually did shoot all five men. Yeah. So, but even then, being present inside the house, whether it was one, five, or ten people, it would still actually have the same effect. Um, Excellent. In between these questions, we have um, three sort of comparison questions that we would, I would just ask him. There would be nothing to do with um, a, a, such a violent act, but they would be to do with uh, things like um, had he in the last, you know, in the prior to 1985, had he physically, um, deliberately hurt a strange person or a stranger? Those type of questions. So they're completely detracted from yeah. the actual act. And then there would have been three what we call known truths. And they would have been uh, very simple. Are you sitting down in a chair? Because I know that he's sitting down. So I get a reading of the truth. Yeah. Um, is your name Jeremy? Uh, and that type of thing. So there would have been those type of questions. Two other questions that would have been asked would have been, do you understand that I will only ask you the questions that we have discussed, because everything is discussed prior to the test? And do you intend to answer each question truthfully? Because that's all I want from him. Yeah. So that's 11 questions in total. And where then comes into that, I then asked him those on a, three separate occasions. So he has a rest of about a minute or two between each chart. Um, and they have to, that gives consistency for the test. So if he's going to lie, he will lie three times. And if yeah. he was going to tell the truth, he would tell the truth three times. It will not go to a lie, truth, lie, on, and, and et cetera. Um, I gave Jeremy his result. I um, did his results whilst I was with him, and we went through the. I went through the results. I checked them three times before I gave those results to him, and I was very pleased to tell him that he was truthful, and that he did not kill any members of his family, whether it was with an Anschutz rifle or any other type of device. But he did not physically do this himself. Well, following. Following this, um, he wanted to ask, have other questions about the hitman, um, the allegations that he paid somebody to do this, yeah. um, uh, and et cetera, and going through quite a few other scenarios. So we made a list of 12 items that I would look at in the future um, that if he was managed to either get arranged for a second test in prison or whether he was going to be released at any point, um, he uh, told me that he would be willing to test, do at least one more test with those same sort of questions on. 
Um, but, uh, now, I only had about an hour and 50 minutes with Jeremy. That was the maximum time I was allowed. And we did have a roughly about 10 minutes after the test, to which we just actually had a general conversation. And he wanted to know, you know, what was going on in the world outside that, because he didn't believe everything in the newspapers, obviously. Um, so we just had a, a very casual chat. I found Jeremy to be a very personable, intelligent man. Um, and also prior to going into the prison, I'd also, um, I couldn't access the results of his psychological test that he'd had, but I was given information that he had was passed every single psychological test that he's ever had yeah, and that true. he's not crazy, he's not a, a schizophrenic, he's not a sociopath, uh, etc. Because if he had been, then obviously I wouldn't have conducted the test anyway. But that was really um, all that went on with that test. Um, when I left the prison, um, there was a, um, a plethora of reporters outside the prison um, who were hassling, if you like, as, as the <laughs> press do. Um, and they wanted to see everything. And they were saying, can we see the results and everything? And I said, I'm, I'm going to give you the results. I said, you've paid for the test. So I can tell you what the results are. I said, but I have to also uh, get permission from Giovanni. Um, and I called Giovanni. At that Giovanni time. was Jeremy's um, legal representative. Legal representative, time. yes, uh, yes, at that point. Um, well, and nobody knew about his past at that point. <laughs> um, I, I personally, I didn't, I didn't get on with the guy. Um, he was very pushy. He wanted things that I wouldn't do. I wouldn't go out of the bounds of things. Uh, but he said, um, you can give them all the information and then he will speak to them. And this is when he added the, uh, the rest of it, because I had a list of questions from Jeremy that he wanted to be asked. And he then added those to it. And then the article came out. Um, and somebody in the UK, of which at that point, there was only nine polygraph examiners. I think it was eight, eight actually. Um, one of those people, and I know who it is, um, told the APA that I had breached the rules and regulation. So Giovanni had uh, published in the newspapers the additional mm. questions that you'd asked Jeremy on his release or during a later detector test. We discussed. Not the ones from the yeah. day. Yeah. He, no, he gave them the ones from the day, but then yeah. he said that then I did a second test on him, uh, and this was all done in 10 minutes, apparently. Whereas his original test took, you know, uh, with all the discussion, around an hour and a half, um, which is around about the minimum that I can do it. Yeah. Um, but then he claims that I then asked him a further 12 questions in the, in the remaining 10 to 12 minutes that we had. So somebody should have realised that I didn't do that. The yeah. test would have been voided. Um, but I've, I've stood by the test. I will always stand by the test, and, uh, and that's all I can do with it. Um, and I've kept as much as I can of his information over the years. Um, I think I still have the newspapers cut in somewhere. But, uh, okay. but that, was, that was my visit to, to Fort Sutton Prison. Yeah. It was excellent. Excellent. So it took about an hour and a half in total to do that initial test. In total, it was about... Um, in, in, a, in a, an ordinary test, if I, was, if I was testing Jeremy in my office, I would probably be with Jeremy for three to three and a half hours because I would have wanted um, a very deep, in-depth story from him. Um, I don't get that luxury in a prison, and they have now cut the legal time down to an hour and 40 minutes um, right. to, to do tests. So, so you have to do a lot of research. You have to do... Um, a great deal of study to make sure that everything that I want to ask is factual. But I usually use what he's convicted of, uh, what he's been charged with, what the conviction was. And if you use that, then the, the obviously the Crown Prosecution and police and everybody else can't say, oh, well, that's not what we charged him with. So, you, so for me to be able to do all of those other questions, which I hadn't done any work on prior to that, um, would have been impossible. And I mean, I know a lot of people come to you who are victims of miscarriage of justice, um, like Luke Mitchell, 
and uh, Ray Gilbert, and you conduct their lie detector tests as well. You, you are highly respected in the field, and a lot of um, victims of miscarriage of justice do approach you, don't they, for these tests? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, I, I do as many as I can. I mean, um, Luke Mitchell's um, test, for instance, that was done through Sandra Lean, who is his legal representative. She's, she's legally trained, but she is not a, a solicitor. But she is, um, she's written books and stuff about uh, injustice, etc. But she managed to get originally um, Luke's mum, Corrine Mitchell, um, and because she was accused of burning um, the clothes, uh, all of his clothes. The neighbour said that she was burning um, all of Luke's clothes in a, in a big drum in the garden. Yeah. And he, and he could smell blood. <laughs> um, skilled. and that that was and the giving also giving Luke an alibi so um that was done by the um the the daily record I think it's the daily record in Scotland yeah, yeah. and they they paid for for that test and I went up um and I did conducted her test they videoed it on remotely um I have never seen that but I don't need to I videoed my own part of that uh, which I had normally tried to do. I was going to ask you about videoing, uh, Terry, because obviously mm. they, we have the problem like um, with documentaries and things like that, that they will not allow Jeremy to be filmed inside the prison. Yeah. So you had no problem with filming him for that, did you? Did you have to sign a release form that you wouldn't release that? Yeah, with, uh, with, with Corrine's, that was done in a hotel in a meeting room, but with Luke's, um, I mean, that was sanctioned by Alex Salmond, who was the first minister at that time. He sanctioned this because it was the biggest, most expensive murder case in Scotland. Um, and I was given un unfettered access. They didn't give me a time limit. And Sandra Lean actually attended in the, in the uh, room as well because she was his legal representative. Um, now, with Luke's, Best, um, I just took a chance. It's the only one that's ever been done. And I just asked the, the prison guard who is standing outside the door if I could use my video, um, like you use a small webcam. Yeah. And he said, I'll find out. And he came back and said, you can use it, providing you do not release it without our permission. So I agreed. Um, and I videoed Luke's test. Yeah. Um, now, I signed a, signed a confidentiality agreement with the prison, with the SPS, and it took about nine months before, not even, I don't think it was quite nine months, but they then wrote to me and said they've reviewed the, the uh, video. They do not see any issues that would uh, compromise the prison, and they said you can release it to Luke's legal team. Now, I didn't release that. I don't get any involvement in those times. Yeah. Things. And um, that was then put on YouTube immediately, which obviously caused its own outcry. Um, people have asked us, why didn't Jeremy's get, because people have seen that interview. Yeah. Uh, and one, one, slide sorry, just a, one thing we should point out is that obviously the Luke Mitchell was done under Scottish law. And Scotland yes. It's a different jurisdiction, so it, it's different rules. We should just make that clear. Well, yeah. Yes. Yes. That's absolutely true, Philip. I mean, the two, our two countries are absolutely different with our prison service. Yeah. Yeah. So well, just clarify for people, Jeremy's wasn't recorded. You didn't have authorisation to record Jeremy's lie detector tests. Yeah. Well, well, when you go into a prison, I mean, you know, I, I don't know if you've visited Jeremy at all, have you? Yeah, we yeah. both yeah, you, Right, you have. So that's great. Um, but when I take, I take in equipment. Now, I have to list down... Uh, all the equipment, it has to be serialised, so every serial number that's on it. And if I take a piece of paper that I have not declared, they can refuse me. Yeah. So I always tell them I've got three sheets of paper, two pens, you know, and then everything. And if I put a webcam on there, they would have refused. Yeah. Now, I, I put webcam on my, because it wasn't the one on the laptop, it was a separate one. And I actually included it, and it's all X-rayed, and they didn't appear to have any objection. And at that point with Luke, I'd already been into probably 20 prisons, some from the same ones, 
had done yeah. about 20 prison visits in Scotland and I've never had an issue, but um, I was never allowed to video. So I think Luke's is, is a, a one-off. Um, yeah, you know. Because not even in America will they allow to you to video inside the prison. Um, but, you know, I, I followed the rules, which you need to, um, and that's, that's where that came from. I still have the letter giving me permission to uh, release it to the, uh, to the client. So that was where I came from. Excellent. Um, but there was some controversy over uh, Luke's test, because if you've seen it, which you obviously have, um, you will notice that he doesn't have an arm cuff. He doesn't have a blood pressure cuff on his arm. Right. Now, at that time, when I did his test, there was a thumb cuff. So it went on the thumb of your left arm. Yeah. Um, and it's actually fantastic. It does exactly the same job without having all that pain from the blood pressure cuff. Um, it was approved by the APA and Lafayette at that time, and that's what I used. And he would have had both his hands down in front of him on his legs. Yeah. Um, I had some three apparently eminent psychologists state that I didn't have an arm cuff on, so how could it be a real test? But I did some interviews with Sky TV, a few newspapers, and I pointed out that we used um, a, a finger cuff or a thumb cuff. Um, and then I asked them if they would like to have a live debate on Sky TV with those three people. I said, I'll fly up tomorrow and, <laughs> and have a debate with you. And they all refused. Um, so, they are, thing, right? <laughs> so they are real eminent people, you know. And I have found out who one of them is, and I challenged him in a blog um, and asked him for his credential because I don't believe that he had the correct credentials to question anybody. Um, but, you know, so I answered all the questions, which I'd always do anyway. But that test was a good test. That's also been quality controlled by five individual um, examiners in America. I don't do it here because there aren't enough what I would term professional guys here. Yeah. So I send them to training schools in America and the APA directors. To get, those guys have been doing this 30, 40 years. Fantastic. Um, and so everything has been validated uh, on both those tests. And when, when, they, peer, when they peer review them, sorry, what, what are they checking? The, 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 the questions are within the... the normal well, they, they do get everything, um, but a lot of the time we have to redact the names and, question, and questions sometimes because you, you can quality control a chart just on the chart's results itself. You can tell the you know, salient points on it for whether if they are relevant questions, comparison questions, you can tell whether that's, that's a, a good test. I send everything. I send the videos, I, I know that if I've got them. I send every single piece that I have so that there is no question about them. But um, I mean, I quality control some uh, tests here in the UK or new examiners, a couple of new examiners. Um, and you have to point out to them that, you know, that sometimes they've given a, a result which I wouldn't have given. And they may have to go back to that client and um, say to them, they need to be retested at the examiner's cost. Whether that happens or not is a, is a whole different yeah. area. But uh, there, you have to do a, that. Is there a baseline of like, a question you ask to establish what is a lie. So do you ask a question that, and ask the, the person who's being tested to give an intentional lie so it sets that level for a lie? Well, they used to, um, you remember that America have, have been using polygraph now for 100 years, and that was in April uh, this year. That was exactly 100 years ago when the FBI used it the first time um, and convicted a murderer. Um, they used to use, even back into when I was training, you know, back, you know, back in the early 2000s, um, they would ask questions like, if they were wearing a, a blue shirt, they would say, are you wearing a bright red jumper to see whether that person had a reaction? But there is virtually no reaction because the polygraph works on guilt and the body reacts to guilt. It's the things that you are hiding inside. And the cognitive load that you have in the front in the front of your head, it's, it takes more. It takes more 
um, power to, to, to answer a question in a lie than the truth. Um, so that was abandoned really and truly in some sort of mid 2000s, but I'd stopped using it pretty much within a year of actually doing tests. Um, they also use, um, a lot of the examiners now use what they call a stim test, stimulation test. So they would ask questions like, um, we can ask you a series of nine questions, all it's just one chart with nine numbers on, and you've got to pick and write down a number between say one and nine, right. write that down and keep that sit on it or do something with it. And then the questions are, um, did you write number one? Did you write number two? Did you write number three? And when they get to the, say, pick number five, you're supposed to get this reaction. Well, the reaction is probably a millimeter, maybe two, um, as opposed to something else. Yeah. Or if they've moved, they may get a bigger reaction on number one, because if a movement will give a similar reaction to a lie. Um, but it, it's, it's a, a game, if you like. It's not really, it's, a, it's supposedly to, to make sure that a person is uh, okay to actually take a test. Right, um, yeah. I, d I don't do them anymore. Some people use cards. They will have three cards and give them and say to the person, pick a card, okay? So you'll have a jack, queen, and a king. And then they'll take one card. The others are left face down, and, and the examiner never touches those cards. They know what they are. And then they ask the same sort of question. To me, it's gimmicky. And to do a test like that when someone's on for murder or sexual crimes, or yeah. even, even infidelity, you are trivialising um, that, that test by playing Absolutely. a game with cards and numbers. So those things um, are there. A majority of people don't bother with them anymore. But the other questions that are you sitting down in a chair um, are the lights on in the room? Is your is your first name, uh, say Jeremy, and, and that type of thing? But you would only ask that once you've had their identification. Well, I wouldn't get ID from Jeremy, but I did know who he was. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that was a big difference. Now, what they do is they give you a baseline because they're known truths. So you're going to see a, a baseline where you're not getting a huge reaction I see, yeah. on your tracing. So that you're getting that as well. Um, it's like um, the comparison questions. Now, when you start off, if I give an instance of, say, a theft, because it would be easier. Somebody's uh, been accused of stealing £5,000 from their company, and it was in cash in a drawer in, in an in a account office. So then I'm going to ask them, did you steal the, uh, I don't even use the money or the amount because most people that steal don't know what they're stealing. Yeah. So did you steal any of the money that's missing from the office drawer on Tuesday? That type of question. Um, now, a comparison question for that would be, um, have you stolen any property from your family? And that would be in their life. Because what I'm doing, before I actually say that, I will go, what do you think of people that steal from their family? And, and they will say, oh, I, I don't think they're right. I said, well, in my world, I think they're scumbags. So you really emphasize something nasty to them. Yeah. Um, they're scumbags. People who steal from their family, they are absolutely <laughs> horrific people. And yet there's probably 40% of the country that steal from their family in some way or have done. You know, even if I used to steal crookney bits out of my dad's pocket when I was a kid. Oh! Right? Yeah. <laughs> you won't remember them. You're too young. I don't know about <laughs> Philip. He might know. <laughs> but, but, the point, but the point of it is, what you're trying to get them to do is, I don't want to be a scumbag. So they're going to say no. So what you're looking for then is a reaction to those questions. So if they have stolen and it will be have you stolen something of value not just anything and value i describe as so you've stolen something like a, a electronic a laptop um their wallet um my, uh, x, uh, x amount of money yeah. and things like that or credit card so you make it large and that way you will then see either they're telling the truth or they're actually lying 
but nobody really wants to admit that they're stealing from their own family after I've described what that person looks like. So yeah. it, there is a bit of psychology within the, the uh, comparison question. So you need to get their mindset. But the, but the actual one about the money, that's absolute, and there's no messing around with that. That's a factual question, and that's what we use. So that's where you can just, you know, uh, um, sort of look at different areas of what you're testing. You, you mentioned, uh, sorry, I was just going to say, you mentioned earlier, Terry, that there, there are quite a few medical conditions that would preclude people from taking a test because yeah. what, one i think of the urban myth is that psychopaths can uh, pass tests because they don't have the right empathy or whatever can you just elaborate on that what, what would preclude somebody from taking a test anybody with a psychological issue so that can be sociopathic uh, it can be schizophrenic um it, it, it's anything like that because you've got you know, there are lots of people now unfortunately walking around in the country um, that, are, that was now called care in the community. But you, we've got dangerous people that have serious psychological issues with split personalities. Who are you testing uh, when you've got somebody with, who's got uh, two, three, four personalities? So you don't know who you're testing. Is it Jekyll or Hyde? Now, yeah. we, are, you know, we are not able to assess a person correctly, not in the short period of time that I have um, a very good psychiatrist or psychologist should have anywhere between 10 to 20 hours of assessment to figure out whether somebody is psychologically unbalanced. We don't get that luxury. But if I'm dealing with um, a sex offender, for instance, and they're going to, I'm testing them to see whether they've um, committed a sexual offence, um, my first 10, 15, 20 minutes of my meeting with them is usually about today's news and it might be about um you know because we're talking casually to them i want to get them comfortable but then my other side of it is to actually talk to them about similar issues oh you know did you see the, the this person you've been accused of this act look at this person they've been accused of this and sometimes you get well perhaps they uh, perhaps the victim deserved it now that's disturbing <laughs> when you start getting that so that yeah. way, my conversation then has to turn, keep going in that direction. And if that continues with those, that line of answering, I'm not going to test them. And then I say to them, I, am, I have got a concern about your psychological state. So I would like a letter from your doctor or a consultant to say that you are psychologically fit to take a test. Yeah. And to be okay. honest, you don't come across many like that. But it, it, it is a safeguard that you have to um, practice. But so just it, to be clear, so, somebody who's been diagnosed with psychopathy wouldn't be able to take the test. No. 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 And then there's people like um, people that have got Parkinson's, for instance, where they can't sit still. Because mm -hmm. on a test, during the, each chart on the test takes five minutes. That's 11 questions, but they do take five minutes to ask because there's a big gap in between them, like 25, 35 seconds. And I vary it because some people count and they're yeah. trying to count to get themselves prepared. But then the questions are also, on a, they're, they're being said in a different order each time as well. Um, so they just answer the questions. All we ask is answer truthfully. Um, but what, where you're coming from with that is that you've got to, You've got to sit perfectly still during that five minutes. That's not moving fingers, toes, legs, muscles, twitching. It's really difficult. And I don't think majority I can do that. Of, yeah, but see, but your answer is the same as everybody's. Oh, I can't sit still. I'm a fidget. I'm a fidget. I use <laughs> my hands. I use my hands to gesticulate and do everything all the time. You can ask my wife, but she'll tell you <laughs> stop moving about. But on a test, my answer to him is, if you are innocent of this, you will sit still for those five minutes. It's, it's, you've got to practice it. The practice sitting still, and I'll put the equipment on them, let them sit in the chair, and, and, and I'll just rehearse going through the questions. And I, and I do rehearse the questions with them two, three, four times, so they know every question. And if they're going to lie, they, they're, it's a deliberate act with it. 
But there's, we also have to be careful of medication. So there are certain medications, um, that obviously illegal substances. I don't test anybody on illegal drugs. Um, it, I give them a warning that when they come to me, they have no illegal substances for 12, 24 hours, sometimes 48, depending what they're on. We can test somebody um, who is on a heroin um, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it, <laughs> substitute. Methadone. Methadone. Yeah. Right. You, um, I want to see the prescription. I want to see the level of dosage. But you also have to bear in mind that a lot of people on methadone are also still using heroin. Um, there's a great deal of them. But if they don't comply with that, so you, you can, I can do a drugs test with them. Um, that's costing a different amount of money. I don't feel it's my job. Um, and I would only get a police kit, so it's a, a, a swab test, um, which they do themselves. But really and truly, I don't want to be involved in that. I use my judgment. Um, I look at the eyes. If they come in with a large pupil dilation, I don't test them because they're either um, they're on something like, you know, um, cocaine, ketamine and those type of drugs or any one of the new synthetic drugs that are out. I mean, you yeah. can't even detect a lot of them. Um, I tell them, don't smoke cannabis. If I smell cannabis on you, when you come in, you will be ejected and I won't test you. So I don't care what you're doing. Well, it's your personal life, what you do, but I'm not testing you. The same with alcohol. Um, no alcohol for 24 hours. If you've had a drink um, and I smell alcohol on you, you're not getting tested. And the only reason is, because even if they'd had a double whiskey before they came in, it isn't really going to affect the test. But that's their get out of jail free card. If they fail the test, they will say, I read that you can't have alcohol. I read. Now they sign a consent form saying they haven't done any of these things, which if they then yeah. tell me that they've done it, I avoid their test and off they go. Yeah. Um, because I can't, I can't be party to that. So I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people come to us and go, "Oh, well, yeah, Jeremy passed his lie detector test, but Jeremy's a psychopath." And yeah. it's like we've got reports for years and years and years and years. It's no, he's not a psychopath. He has no mental health issues whatsoever. And you know, it'd be good for you to like, you know, add clarity to that for people. Yeah. Well, it's it's going back to one of the big cases in the states with the FBI, Jer uh, Jeremy uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. I mean, he passed seven polygraph tests with the FBI back in the what, seven, late 70s, 80s, in the 80s, I think it was. But he passed it because at that point, they didn't realise how many personalities he had. He was a complete, complete lunatic. Um, but they, nobody had actually bothered to investigate any of those things. So nobody knew what was going on, but he passed those tests. And it's only when... Somebody, some psychologist have reviewed them and said, this man shouldn't be tested because he's crazy. You know, mm. he's, he's got serious, serious issues. Um, so they had to renounce all of that. But by that time, it's all over the, the media, it's all in the press, and you, his lawyers are saying he's passed, why is he being convicted, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and he murdered and chopped up. Well, who knows how many? Yeah. I think they found 30. Yeah. People, but there was probably a lot more. So there, there are limitations, and you have to recognise those limitations um, in what we do. Now, the counter of that is the new eye detect, because then we don't have to worry about movement, because um, it's all done with the eyes. So all we're worried about now is eye dilation, because the infrared cameras are monitoring the eyes. Um, and the only thing that we we care about is if somebody comes in with large pupils, my first question is, do you have an eye problem? And if they say no, I'm going to say to them, well, I can't test you today because I believe that you've got eye drops in of some description. So it's just a simple eye drop will enhance that pupil. Now, that's what we're measuring. Um, whether they move their feet, their hands, and all the rest has no bearing on the test. Um, and that's automated as well. And that's very, very good, which is what that's I would say. Very reliable. Jeremy. Very reliable. Um, and it's, it's, getting, it's getting out there all the time now. 
What's so that? that's what I wouldn't want to do with Jeremy. And I know well, we wrote, to, we did to mention it to Jeremy and he put an application in yeah. uh, for you to conduct that with him, but it's not been approved. So um, he's had one lie detector test in prison, so... You know, well, I've been like... in Wakefield because um, he's still in Wakefield, is he? He's in Wakefield, yeah. That's a horrendous prison for him to be in. Um, so I've been in Wakefield, I think, three, maybe four times, and I tested one person twice in there. Um, so that they shouldn't really have any objections. But the Home Office, um, they've put out a statement to a lot of prisons saying that... Um, if you can avoid doing tests, because they've set a precedent already, um, you can, I've seen the letter unofficially, but it's all, almost saying, um, if you can find a reason for them not to come in, then stop them. Now, G4S prisons um, down in Wales and stuff, actually, I, I ju just prior to COVID, I tested in three prisons in January and early February. Um, the, one of the people that was in there then wanted to have a, an ID tech test for a different issue, but he got transferred to a Serco prison, and Serco will not entertain them whatsoever. Right. So, it, so it is to do with private prisons and, and obviously government prisons as well. So there's, there's no continuity. Now, in Scotland, um, back in, um, if I go back, six years maybe yeah about six years um the sps uh, director the uh, scottish prison service director uh, asked me contacted me and asked me if i would assist them to make it easier for polygraph examiners to be, get access to prisons right and this is the big lie <laughs> uh, because uh, they said we only want to have examiners in prisons that are, op that are members, full members of the British Polygraph Association, of which I was the secretary at that point, and I still am now. I've taken it back because they let in too many um, people of questionable ethics. Um, so I did all this work with them over a period of a year um, to simplify it so that when they made an application, they could come in within one week. But sometimes it would take two months, maybe more. Yeah. And from the day that it was all approved, not a single polygraph examiner has been to a Scottish prison. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So all the facilities are there and they're just... Um, and I've written to them many times. I've written to... Um, uh, you, have to you have to forgive me with government people because they change all the time. <laughs> um, but but they but I mean they all they do is I write to everybody I've written to every home secretary since I've been an examiner in sixteen years, yeah. um, and they change quite frequently. And that, frankly, they never bother to reply. They pass you to some minion, and you just get lost in the ether. Um, it seems a bit of a uh, like um, uh, hypo hypocrisy of them, but they use their the lie detector when they're releasing a sex offender to make sure that they're not going to offend again, because if they are, they fail it, they're not released, but yet they're not allowing lie detector tests to be used to prove innocence. Well, they're not, they're not, they're not being released. They're on licence. Uh, and they do select, and I don't understand the selection sometimes with them, um, but they're only being tested on their licence. So they're not doing it on their conviction. They've never been tested on their conviction at all. Right. So if they're, if they're brought out and on licence, they mustn't associate with paedophiles. They mustn't associate with anybody making films, downloading child pornography, um, or hanging around certain areas of schools, going to certain towns. That's what their test is about. Um, right. So they will be tested usually within three to four weeks when they really go from prison. Um, if they pass the first test, they won't get another one for about three months. Now, if they fail that first one, which means that they've come out and virtually gone straight back into what they were doing, they will get a further test a week later. And if they fail that, 
they go back and serve the rest of their sentence. Right. Now, I also, I also know that, I mean, there's about 50 police officers and 50 probation officers now in the country. I know that they are very frustrated with this, that they can't use polygraph to prosecute. So it isn't to do with the police. This is due, to do with NOMS, um, the National Offender Management. It's to do with them. Um, that that's, these are the parameters that they've got. Because um, I, I know for, in Essex that the Essex police would like to um, use polygraph on illegal immigrants. They would like to use them on people trafficking, drug dealing, and that type of thing. The areas right. they're looking at, um, they're not going to get cooperation from those particular range of people. So it would be a waste of time, to be perfectly honest. But there's lots of other things they could be doing. That's Sorry, Philip. The ironic, Terry, in that we'd like to use polygraphs on Essex Police. Um, <laughs> but but you're not alone because I have I have requested it many times. Because um, in the last maybe four or five years, there have been oh, numerous, I can't even remember the number now, of police officers from constables to senior officers involved in paedophilia, downloading child porn falsifying evidence, uh, even on things like shoplifting. Um, there, uh, there's, there's one just being done now for driving a police car in Essex. He's not a trained police driver, but he had his blues and twos on, on the top of his panda car, and was speeding through all the traffic, and he's now been dismissed. So mm -hmm. it, now I've been asking, um, and I can go back to 2007, the same year as I see Jeremy, we approached as a, there was then, I said, about seven or eight uh, examiners, and we approached Hendon Police College, because that's where the training mainly took place. Yeah. Then. And we approached them because at that time they'd had um, nine uh, recruits um, of an ethnic background who turned out to be jihadists. And it took, they'd already spent well over £100,000 on training before they found out that they belonged to some of the um, mosques that belonged to Chowdhury um, and Abu Hamza and that type of thing. And then right. they dismissed them. Now, what we asked them is, this was just polygraph then, why aren't you vetting? I mean, it takes a year to vet, to, to, to get application for a policeman anywhere yeah. in the country. Why aren't you using a polygraph use your own people, use us, use whatever, on recruitment, right from day one, see what their background is, find out, do two or three tests over a week, find out about, you know, their religious beliefs, whether they're terrorism, and all those things. And we had one meeting uh, with one not-so-senior official uh, who said he would get back to us, and when he did come back months later, it was, uh, we're not interested. And yet, the corruption within the police per se is incredible. You know, um, Absolutely. the, the programme, is it the Thin Blue Line or whatever it was, the one that was on just recently? Or Bent Coppers. All Bent. That's, that's pretty true. Um, you can ask most coppers and they would tell you that that's largely true in a lot Absolutely. of cases. And it's really well documented yeah. that yes. things like that in that programme occurred. And it's so, like... In Jeremy's case, we can actually say, we know you've lied. This is the lie. We can show them the lie. Yeah. And no, every well, time it's, it's turned like against Jeremy. Him, when, I, when I first was asked to do Jeremy in prison, I, I contacted Essex Police and asked them if, I, if they had some files that I could look at um, on Jeremy's conviction. And I was told that they were completely destroyed in a storage fire uh, external from Chelmsford Police. And so I accepted that. See, from lie. But that was proven to be a lie a few years ago that they're all now surfaced. So they're, they're just unwilling to give you any information. Oh, um, absolutely. I, find I, mean, I find it appalling that, I mean, apparently the uh, Pretty Patel asked or told BJ Harrington, the new commissioner, or police commissioner, um, to make free all of those documents for you guys, right, and to for the public, and they're refusing to do so. 
It was actually a court order from 2002 from the mm. appeal court judges who made court orders to repeal, um, disclose all the documentation. We're still yeah. waiting. We've been, we've took, we even took the CPS to court last year. We didn't win. Uh, Priti Patel isn't, is very negative towards Jeremy. She is the MP for Whitton, where yeah. the relatives come from, and she's made a lot of negative comments about Jeremy in the past. He shouldn't have a campaign, shouldn't do this, shouldn't, she's raised issues in Parliament. So um, she's no friend of the campaign or Jeremy, to be honest, but no. she'd like to give us the documents that would be very much appreciated. Yeah, I know. Um, I'm not going to comment on on that particular issue <laughs> with, um, with that person at the moment because I have an ongoing issue in that area. So. I think a lot of people have an, a lot of ongoing issues in the book. Yeah, but oh. I mean, it, it, you know, it's 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 what it is at the moment, and unfortunately, I mean, I get a lot of people say, uh, "Did your does your polygraph work? Did he really pass the test?" And I said, "Put it this way." I'm, I'm prepared. I'm a stand-up guy. I'll stand and defend that all day long against all comers. But what I want you to reflect on is this. Tomorrow, it could be you. Mm -hmm. The police could knock at your door at 3 o'clock in the morning and say, you are involved in a murder, crime, a serious crime, drugs, whatever, and you're going to say, well, hang on, where's the evidence? And they say, oh, we'll get to that later. But by that time, your name is now out in the public domain and you are finished in, that, in those terms. Absolutely. And you could be convicted without any hesitation by 12 people who are not even listening at the trial. They're not listening to anything that's going on. Um, because I've, I've sat on a jury many years ago. What and, if the jury is... Uh, and they don't listen. One of them in Jeremy's case actually fell asleep, Terry. Yeah. And we've got it documented that they fell asleep. Yeah. And, the, and these are our peers that are to protect us. If I was ever done for anything, I would never be tried by a jury. I would ask, ask a high court judge, sit on your own, pal, and, and uh, make your judgment. Because I don't trust my fellow people around me. Because they don't take that. I don't think that they're not qualified. In financial cases, they're not qualified in murder cases. They don't understand. And unfortunately, and this isn't, a, this isn't a, a, an immigration thing, but how many juries today have Eastern Europeans on that are living here for many years, actually, who do not understand our law, let alone anything else? They are listening to something. And I've spoken to several people who have been on juries, and they said, I had no idea what they were talking about. So I went with the majority, mm. and that and that's a that's a disgrace. That's Absolutely, not, that's not justice. Um, no. Unfortunately, we haven't got justice. No. You mentioned earlier. You break. You broke down, Philip. Yeah. Start again. Yeah. I can just pick up on an issue you mentioned earlier about balance. Um, because obviously somebody watching this might think, well, all the cases you're mentioning are, are people who claim they've been the victim of a miscarriage of justice. But you've also been involved in quite a few high profile cases where people have failed the test, haven't you? Yeah. Um, I think the one that comes to mind, I believe, Adrian Prout, was that one you? I didn't do Adrian. Um, that, was oh. a, that was a colleague of mine. But um, to be fair... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'm trying to be as fair as I can to the guy. Adrian Prouse had already confessed to his solicitor before right. he took the polygraph test. Right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, Rick, the point I'm trying to make is that, yeah. you know, people do fail these tests. This is not a one-way um, street. In all of the tests that I've been done in prison, I would say that um, it's around about 5% have passed. Oh, really? Only 5%. Yeah, about 5%. Oh, right, right. That's really interesting. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, and see, I tell them in prison. I mean, with eye detect, I can't give them an answer because I need the internet to connect to actually get that result. But when I do a polygraph, I tell them the result and I say to them, you've you failed your test. And they go, what does that mean? I said, you didn't tell the truth. And they went, oh, okay. 
And most of them will go, I, I just thought I'd be okay. Yeah. 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 Well, but I, I said, but you that... can't you you know you can't use this information. You can't go retrospectively back and use it as evidence. And they mm. most of them, but to a T, they say this is to prove to their families and friends that they didn't do what they were convicted. Now, I can't tell you about this particular person, but I tested them a couple of weeks back for a, a, a documentary, okay? Um, but you will, so, you will soon see this. Um, it's going to be on TV, six episodes. But I can't tell you, but this person um, served his sentence, um, was convicted, served his sentence, on, on what I term pretty flimsy evidence. Um, but he, he was released some years ago. He's gone to a very successful property business. I don't know how he financed that, um, but he's got a very profitable business. He's written several books, um, does TV interviews. Um, even when he was down with me at my offices, well, I had the boardroom over the road. That's where you came to, Yvonne. Did you come there or was it somebody else? No, no, I haven't been. I haven't met you in person. Oh, right. Terry, yeah. um, we, had the, we used the boardroom earlier a, a couple of years ago to do something. But in there, um, he sat there and he, he gave me a signed copy of his book with, a, with all compliments in. He fouled his eye detector. And, he, and he, had, he sat there and the producer guy, he sat there. I'm telling this guy he's failed. He's sitting across from me. And the, I'm looking at this producer. <laughs> there, and he's looking at me thinking, what the hell? <laughs> oh, dear. And, I, and I said, well, he goes, well, what did I fail on? I said, all of it. <laughs> and he said, okay, well, when they get new technology, perhaps the new technology will pick up that I was telling the truth. I said, this is the new technology. The last one was 100 years old. This is the new stuff, six years old. I said, listen, you know full well you were involved in that. I said, but listen, you've, you've done your time. You've served your sentence. You've done your time. And now you're making money on the back of, I didn't do it. Um, and he went away and said, he, went, he shook my hand and said, thanks very much. He said, wow, see, that's pretty good. <laughs> so... That's where that's people that you deal with. I mean, yeah. he's 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 not he's not going to go back to prison. He served his sentence. He's and and the evidence was very slim, but he but it, he gave a story to me before the test that didn't show the same story he gave to other people. Yeah. Says I yeah. had all that. I had all of that. So that's what people do. But um, when that comes on, I'll I'll let you know. Yeah, oh, fantastic. Yeah. Well, that five percent figure is, is one we should use just to give people the context. Yes, I, it is. I had, yeah. I had no idea it was that low. I assumed it was you know maybe fifty. But, 50 but you not. you've got to remember that the people in prison are, yeah. um, as you know, with Jeremy, they're desperate, um, yeah. and they will go. I've been convicted of this. I've been convicted of that, and and I want to show my family that I didn't do it. But a lot of those people have overwhelming evidence against them. Hmm. Now, to people like Jeremy, Luke, uh, Ray Gilbert, and, and people like them, there's not a shred of evidence against them. Hmm. nothing. So why were they convicted? Which is why I say to people, tomorrow it can be you. With hmm. no evidence, you can be convicted. So is that, just to be clear, Terry, is that 5% figure just for prisoners or across yes, the just, just for prisons. Yeah, just for prisons. But, but just give, give us an idea. You obviously mentioned the eye detector test, which obviously is, is new, leading-edge technology. But what other things are in development, if anything? Well, that, that, this is. I mean, this is. Um, I took this on back in 2015. Um, and it had just come out. It had been out about seven months. And the reason that uh, the company Converse, and this is their T-shirt. Oh, you can't see it. <laughs> Converse. Um, that is the reason they got hold of me is because I, I was doing polygraph on um, a lot of uh, very high ranking sports people that have been uh, been told they you know banned because of drugs etc. Yeah. Well, drug testing is not not great. I mean, I Tony, I've got a business partner with ID Tech, 
and we have visited all the different drug UK drug agencies and stuff and talked to them about using iDetect because drug testing has got a maximum on certain drugs, 90 days of testing. And these a lot of these athletes avoid getting the test. They're supposed to comply as part of their job, but they actually don't comply. They, uh, they're never in when, they, when the uh, testers come around to see them. Um, and there's all sorts. So they're delaying the timing all the time. And I said, but with iDetect and polygraph, there's no time limit. If you took drugs 10 years ago to enhance yourself 10 years ago, we're going to find out. Because it's, have you ever? Taken yeah. like um, yeah. blood let uh, blood blood doping and stuff like that. So I just done um uh, and it was actually a, quite a public test at the time. It was a uh, Roman Quetz who is um he's a cyclist and he was in Tour de France and then Tour de Spain. And they, they, I didn't know there was all these different Tour de somethings. <laughs> he he was um he got barred for apparently taking Clenbuterol, um which is a fat stripper. And then they accused him of um, doing this blood doping, where they draw the blood, put stuff in it, and, and give him a full blood transfusion. Um, and I went to the country where he comes from, and um, over two days, and tested him, and he cleared his test. The following week, he was in the court of arbitration in Lausanne, in Switzerland. Um, he didn't. You now I was going to testify for him, but. Um, the court had already told his lawyer the day before that they'd all got, dropped all charges because they'd sent them the report plus the doping stuff that they had, the, you know, or the drug testing was inconsistent. Um, it was not, it was, uh, some of it was um, um, not done in the right time timeline, so they couldn't do anything. Well, uh, one of the operatives in um, one of the managers at Converus in America was is a cycling fan and read this article about it. And they contacted me and just said, would you like to trial our new eye detective, which I've never heard of. So um, the unfortunate bit was I had to purchase it as well. It wasn't just. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that and that was um, around about four thousand pounds. But I thought I'll give it a try. Um, and they did say that if I really didn't like it, they would reimburse me. But they wanted a commitment from me. And the moment I got hold of this instrument, I loved it. Um, it's fully automated. But from then, it's, it was a great big station, comes in a big pelican case. And we now, now my latest version is on a laptop. And that's all you have is a laptop and a gym rack. Um, and it's a fantastic piece of kit. Um, so I've gone through the stages, but you can now, it's now been developed that you don't, because you have to read questions on the screen. So they've now developed it for uh, people that can't read and write, so that it's, you, you listen to it, so you can listen through it. However, you'd ask, why would the eyes be involved? Because there's icons on the screen. And if they take their eyes off the icon while this is listening, or this is going through, um, they will miss the instruction, miss the, what's going on, and it will still do the same job. Um, but we can do Excellent. it now in, can now do it in any language. Um, it can be done in all sorts of uh, scenarios. But it's quick. It's one of the tests is called a directed lie test. It takes near, just under 20 minutes. And then the full blown uh, multiple comparison test. And they use that for, for serious crimes or pre-employment screening, uh, which takes 28 minutes. And there's no interview. You don't have to have an interview with it or anything. You just bring them in. It's already pre-done, so you have to have all the information before the day. They sit down, comply with doing the test. But there's also countermeasures that, that people try and do, like closing their eyes all the time, fast blinking, um, looking away. And the computer actually goes, you're not complying. You, don't, you haven't got to do anything. I sit, across, I sit across the room looking at my phone. So, <laughs> um, but, you know, you can, it, it's a, fan, a fantastic piece of kit. And for me, it is the new polygraph. Um, I try to use it all the time now. Um, is it because, is it, is it, sorry, is it, is it measuring a number of different metrics? Presumably it's not just eye dilation. Yes, it is. It's eye dilation, blink rate, blood volume, um, but it's mainly on the eye dilation. 
because again, when somebody reads, when somebody reads, they're all little short statements, um, and it might say, "I am not guilty of stealing the briefcase from the office." Okay. Now, if they did steal the briefcase from the office, as soon as they see briefcase office, their eyes change because again, the cognitive load it takes more. Now, all they're using is a mouse. It's got two colours on it, green and red, and they mustn't look at it. So you you give them a practice on it to make sure they understand what they're doing. Um, but even then, to make sure that you're going to tell the truth to this, you need to have cognitive load. And if you're going to lie, that cognitive load, milliseconds, but it's that millisecond that affects the pupil. Right. And that's where that comes in. And, and when we totally start look, sorry? Totally involuntary re reaction. It's, it? it's totally involuntary. And you and and apart from eye drops, no other drugs affect it. Wow. So it's got it's got a huge potential. Now, one operator can, can do, you know, with one station, they can do um, up to about 14 people in a day. In a polygraph, you can do three. Mm. Now, I can also use four stations and do, say, 10 people, because it would take time to sit them down, but I could do 40 people in one day in a booth. So mm. in my office, I now have two booths on one side of the office to do two people at a time. But I only do people that are on the same, with the same company or yeah. the same issue. I don't get two strangers in. Yeah. But they don't see each other. There's no distraction. Um, and they're in and out and gone. So oh, now the, a a tip. <laughs> the APA, the American Polygraph Association, objected to being used with in an APA situation. So... To comply with a, a thing that's called EPA, it's the Employee Polygraph Protection Act, because in the 80s, or from the 80s, everybody was using polygraph to hire employees, including McDonald's, who were on then for $5 an hour. And it was being totally abused. Um, so they brought in this act to stop it. But they've just approved, they approved it earlier this year, um, around February this year it was approved. Um, Converus have, have actually added, just for the American market, they've added a blood pressure um, um, pressure for the finger. Uh, so that's back on the cards. Um, and two small pads that go on the hands for sweat me. And that now turns this into a new polygraph acceptable by the APA. We don't need that in this country. We don't need it in Europe. We don't need it virtually anywhere else. So we don't use it. It's just to satisfy us different states and state laws in America. Yeah. So it's always on. It's always on improvement. Um, and I'm I do the updates with every improvement that we do. And we the, we had the virtual conference this year. Um, I think that's why I couldn't talk to you last time, wasn't it? Yeah. We had our yeah. virtual conference uh, for three days. Um, and and it, the new technology, the new ways they're coming out with things, is fantastic. Um, and it's been used in several prisons. Um, there's a man being taken off of death row, um, facing to go to either a, a retrial or to abandon his court case altogether um, in, in the States. So I can send you some wow. links for those. Um, yeah, no, and, they didn't, and they didn't need um, stipulation, which they do with polygraph. That's where prosecution and defence have to agree to use polygraph in, a, in America. Um, I detect didn't come under that, so they were just allowed to use it, and the court accepted it. So there's there's lots of different benefits to to doing this, but the biggest one is it takes out the subjective result from some from people like me. So the uh, result is coming out automatically. It's about two percent less accurate than a polygraph. Is nothing in real terms, um, and and so for me, it's a no brainer be using it so that's, that's, that's what you reckon accuracy of what terry about 90 just like it's 90 a 90 percent uh, on the i detect and polygraph well that's speculation because the american polygraph association say 90 to 92 you'll see adverts for people going it's 99 um but that's not true it all depends on the examiner 
if, um, if we've got a poor examiner who has not conducted the test and, and all their research properly, then the results are never going to come out properly accurate. Yeah. Um, and that, unfortunately, in the UK now, we have identified five examiners that are working for organised crime and taking bribes. And I can't and I cannot name those people. Um, they have been reported, but that's down to the authorities to deal with um, for, wow. for that. So, but unfortunately, that's what we've got now in the UK. Hmm. Ten thousand in America and very few, very few cheats. Hmm. Uh, it's it's a well, setting it, sounds, it sounds like I detect is going to be the future, and uh, yeah, that, that's the problem. Well, I've been I've been talking to the government uh, quite a few years um, and Tony where we keep getting pushed back. Um, but we're now after well, about five years, we've been talking to the government and it takes that long to actually keep them interested. And that corner has just been turned. Um, Excellent. We have we have one police chief who is in charge of uh, downloading child pornography for the whole country. He is very impressed and very interested in it, but he has to get home office approval, and that's proving to be our stumbling block. And one of those stumbling blocks is me. You know why? Because the particular, because the particular home office person uh, knows all about me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, she's very aware of what I do who I support, and I think that's causing an issue for them. Yeah, and I, and, get, sorry? She won't be there forever. No, she won't. And, um, and also, see, I belong to Essex Chambers of Commerce, and, um, which she is also supports and stuff. So she knows all about our company. She knows all about what's going on. But then she also hears my name being said, and then she knows what I'm doing. So we sort of get blanked in that way. But there, that, that's life. That's uh, people's choices. Um, officially, you're not going to do anything with it. But as you say, that person won't be there forever. Exactly. Yeah. Well, are there any, any last questions? Because I think we need to keep an eye on the time in terms of what yeah. we can yeah. show. Yeah, no, I thought that was absolutely fascinating. Uh, Thank you so much, Terry. Really appreciate My pleasure. It. Yeah, my pleasure. And, you know, if, if anyone's got questions, um, you can always just drop me an email and I'll email them all back. I'll e just email them to me and I'll answer them for you in any which way I can. Uh, oh, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, at that point, we'll wrap it up. And thanks again.